Hello, everyone. My name is Kristen Brogdon. I am Northrop's Director of Programming, and I am delighted to welcome you to the event, Let's Say Grace and Talk About It, a panel discussion about the aesthetic forms of grace as a way of artistic expression and the human forms of grace as healing and empowerment. For access purposes, I will let you know that I am sitting in front of a cozy fireplace. I have blonde hair, blue glasses, and I'm wearing a black top. Before we begin, it is important to acknowledge that the University of Minnesota Twin Cities is located on the ancestral, contemporary, and traditional homelands of the Dakota people. Northrop and the university are committed to collaborative relationships with the sovereign tribal nations of Minnesota. Our new exhibit in the Northrop Gallery titled Why Canoes is just one example of this collaborative work. I look forward to the day when we can welcome you to see it in person. Tonight's panel discussion is part of an online residency that we're hosting this week with the dance company Evidence in celebration of the 20th anniversary of one of the company's signature works titled Grace. We have a community dance class Tuesday night and a screening of Grace on Wednesday night, followed by a Q&A with artistic director Ron Brown and University of Minnesota dance faculty member Vibo M. And you can find more information about both of those events at northrop.umn.edu. Thursday night, February 18th, we hope that you will join us for a performance of Evidence live streaming from the Joyce Theater in New York. Northrop is co-presenting that performance with the Joyce Theater, Dance Cleveland, and Tri-C Performing Arts. And the performance will be available through March 4th on demand. Tickets are available on our Northrop website for that event as well. And I see that a number of you from Cleveland are in the audience tonight. So we welcome you as well as our Twin Cities and New York audiences. Before I introduce our panelists, I will encourage you to introduce yourselves to each other in the chat. Let us know where you are zooming in from and make sure that you select all panelists and attendees if you wanna say hi to everyone. If you have questions for the panelists at any time, you can click the Q&A button, which should be right next to the chat function on your Zoom bar. I'll bring those questions into the conversation for the last 15 to 20 minutes or so and our Northrop front of house staff are here to help if you need it. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our panelists. I'll list everyone first and then give each of them a chance to introduce themselves in more detail and tell you about their current work. Our guests tonight are Ronald K. Brown, artistic director and founder of Evidence. Dr. John Hallberg, the director of the Center for the Art of Medicine at the University of Minnesota Medical School. Gerard Klass, chef of Soul Bowl, and Tony Pierce Sands, Artistic Director of Two Dance. So I welcome you all, feel free to unmute yourselves, turn your cameras on and join the conversation. And, um, and we will get started with, with Mr. Brown, if you can um, <laughs> tell us a little bit more about yourself and, and what you're working on currently. So uh, uh, born in Brooklyn, New York, uh, found evidence 35 years ago, can't believe it, uh, but excited that we've been able to because of some uh, being able to quarantine and work in bubbles, we've got this concert ready. We're doing four solos, uh, one duet from uh, 1996, and then we're doing uh, Mercy, which is the companion piece to Grace with original music by Michelle and Degashello. So that's my major focus right now, <laughs> getting the company safely on stage. We'll be in the theater on Wednesday, getting tested tomorrow and then in the theater Wednesday, doing a tech rehearsal, dress rehearsal, and then going up on Thursday. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Hallberg, we'll have you go next. Thanks, Kristen. Hi, everyone. So I'm John Hallberg. I'm a family physician. And though I was introduced as being the director of the new Center for the Art of Medicine at the University of Minnesota Medical School, I actually spend five days a week seeing patients in clinic. Um, that is my love and passion and everything I do is informed by, by caring for people. And as you can imagine, it's been kind of a crazy time um, during this last year for so many reasons, way beyond the pandemic, but to have experienced um, firsthand, you know, shutting a clinic down, trying to adapt, going virtual, continuing with some of that seeing patients through masks and face shields, uh, trying to make human connection with that, making people feel comfortable and trying to reduce the fear of that, 
to navigate testing and now to navigate how to get people immunized. Um, it's really been interesting. And grace is something I've been thinking about a lot lately because um, people are trying to exhibit grace and sometimes people are not capable of exhibiting grace. And um, it's, uh, it's been a trying time. With all of that as, as context though, I've also been really lucky to um, be expressive creatively, even as a physician. We've created this center during a pandemic. We've been putting on a daily blog. We created a show for public television where you hope to learn any minute now, any day now, if it's gonna go um, be picked up for national distribution. Um, I've got colleagues who are doing story slam work that have been conducted virtually with learners and, and medical students to try and express themselves during this time. So, um, you know, time of trial and, and um, intense sadness, um, but also a time for thinking creatively in, in new and different kinds of ways. Thank you. Chef Class, we'll have you go next. Hi, my name is Chef Gerard Class, uh, and me along with my beautiful wife, Brittany, uh, own Sobo. And we also own a new concept called Bad Wings that are both uh, located in North Loop. Uh, I'm from Minneapolis. I grew up uh, in Seattle. Uh, and I'm super excited to kind of talk about this topic. The uh, tagline uh, for our business is Say Grace. Uh, and that's something that we had previous to, to the pandemic. So, um, you know, we our, our industry has kind of been decimated. Uh, as most of you know, restaurants have taken a really tough hit during this time. And um, so we are kind of in the rebuilding mode where we're looking uh, at the third location right now uh, and just looking to see like, what does this new frontier of restaurants look like um, going forward? And how do we continue to uh, provide opportunities you know, for, for black and brown people here in the Twin Cities in the culinary arts field um, and continue uh, the important work to tell the, the story of soul food. I'm very passionate about that and making sure that that doesn't get lost in um, you know, this generation and the generations to come um, that I continue to tell those stories and, and be able to show that hospitality um, that I was blessed to experience before I knew it was a was a thing um, and continue to make sure that that makes its way into the fabric of, of uh, the American culinary scene kind of going forward. So that's me in a nutshell and excited to be here all with you tonight. Thank you. And Ms. Pierce Sands, last but not least. Hey, everyone. Um, first of all, thank you so much for Soul Food and Soul Bowl in the Twin Cities. I grew up, I'm from St. Paul, Minnesota, and it was really difficult besides my grandmother's house to find some good soul food. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, yes, my name is Tony Pierce Sands, uh, she, her, hers, and I am the founder and artistic director of Two Dance. And this time has brought incredible gifts along with challenges. And I think those go hand in hand. Um, we are working at Two Dance to be able to keep the art, the training, the breath, the community, um, the creativity, the sense of human beings with young people um, at the school to be able to gather when we can gather healthy or stay on Zoom when we can't. Um, and it really, in a very challenging way, this time has brought um, the purpose forward of the work in which is continually important and I am thankful for friends um, like Brother Ron, who continue to bring grace forward and not just remind us, but keeps us, keeps it in our body of the importance of the connectivity of what we do. So that's where I'm at. That's what I'm working on. And that's what I hope to continue to work on. Um, as that energy spirals out into the world because we need that. And I look forward to what is to come. That's me in a nutshell. Well, thank you. And, and I think that that's a really nice segue into kind of the first question that I have for all of you. So Tony, maybe we'll just stay with you for a little while. 
because I'm, I'm interested to, to hear from all of you, how has Grace shown up for you over the last year? Well, we'll also talk about where Grace is missing, but I'd like to start with the idea of how Grace has shown up. And so Tony, you talked about how, um, how purpose has come to the forefront for you. Are there any examples that you can share with us about how that's happened or, or other examples of Grace that you'd like to, to share over the past year? You know, sure. I am so inspired by, I want to say the youth are younger than my generation. Um, as my generation, or as I feel, I am struggling with making sense and how to move forward. Um, I see these young people and they come into the studio and they're exhausted and they've been literally zoomed out. Um, and somehow they just pull like that organic, natural, youthful energy as, as hard as it is to get moving forward. They bring that and they do this in such a unassuming way. And, and the sense of grace of their presence. So um, I feel that they carry us in, in this time in a very interesting way. And I'm personally, I feel that I'm working on as um, a leader and a teacher and um, the creator of an organization of, of continuing to, to feel grace from others. So that is about slowing down and allowing others to be present as these young people are continuously and open and I find that in a in a sense of grace um, of slowing down to be able to be led. And I find that, that there's there's moments of of consciousness that is about thankfulness and um, generosity and grace. Am I supposed to? Continue? No, you're, you're fine. I'm having a little <laughs> Zoom trouble here. I couldn't unmute. So I was going to ask Gerard, since since you have you know say grace in the in the forefront, just in terms of your tagline, you know, how, like how has that been a reminder for you? How how has that been present for you? Um, I, I really like what Tony said, like having a purpose brought to the forefront. Um, I think in the hospitality industry, for me, I've been reminded. Um, that the sole purpose of what we do is to serve. And uh, I think a lot of times, you know, we're busy or you know, things are going well. I, I know I can get caught up in the business side of it and expansion and all those different things. Um, and this uh, year has really reminded me that um, the reason, the story that I'm carrying on the legacy is to kind of slow down, to really be able to look at people and to be able to serve them. Uh, and it's also been really exciting to see uh, my staff be able to take a break um, just from our busy setup and normal and go about the process of like looking for those who need to be served. You know, a lot of time in the restaurant, everybody's coming to us and, you know, that makes it simple for us. We just serve who comes, uh, but it's kind of flipped that on its head. And um, we uh, launched a program that was called Food for Your Soul. And we, what we ended up doing is we allowed people to sponsor meals. And instead of us kind of sitting in the restaurant, we would go out and deliver meals to people who were um, at or below the poverty level. There's a lot of things for uh, school age kids and uh, frontline workers, uh, but kind of just specifically for the urban community, there wasn't a lot of opportunities and grocery stores were burning down and different things. And so, we really kind of challenged ourselves and found that um, we had an opportunity to show grace and be able to be there um, and serve as, as like this hub for food. And a, a lot of people is just a break to be able to um, share a meal from all of the stress of what was going on. Um, and so it showed up for me more as an opportunity, I think, to really kind of lean into who we are, what type of business we are. Um, and it's, it's, it's really allowed me to have relationships with our customers and people in the community in a different way uh, than I think we would have had with, with other circumstances. So um, th that, that say grace, we just try to keep as part of like the fabric of uh, our brand that, you know, even if we're busy or what's going on, we still want to be able to slow down 
acknowledge people, be present with them, serve them, um, and just understanding like that impact that a, that a great meal can have, uh, you know, with all type of situations happening. If you can sit down to eat something that you can enjoy, we can provide just that little bit of, of, of a break from everything that's going on. So that's really been um, uh, of where I've seen it. And it's just pushed me to grow, um, I think, as a leader. And um, I, I've seen a lot of different industries and just seen how leaders have um, fight or flight, I will say, with everything that's going on. And for us, we kind of just said, regardless if the business stays open, we're going to continue to kind of focus on serving people. Um, and it provided this boomerang effect that has allowed us to stay open. So. Ron, I'm going to go to you next. And I know that all of this has a certain kind of double meaning for you, because when we talk about grace, grace is a concept, but grace is also, you know, a piece that, that you and your company work on in the studio. Um, how has grace shown up either way for you? Well, we've been uh, really fortunate. We had, we finished our joy season in 2020, March 1st, and had given the company the month off. And then our cell, the associate artistic director and I went to, First we went to St. Louis to set some work on some students. One COVID scare there, uh, but still it was kind of far away. We went to Pittsburgh to uh, audition some young people for this piece we have on Earth Together. And we auditioned them on Saturday and Sunday. Monday we had one rehearsal and then COVID was real. Everything shut down. I was, I'm the oldest of four. I have a sister who's in, in Brooklyn, two years younger than me. And she said, brother, please stay in Pittsburgh. <laughs> Things are not good here in, in, in New York. So this family caretaking took over um, in a really incredible, incredible way. Then we were fortunate enough to get some um, a loan that helped us come into rehearsal. And I just dreaded, I would never teach online, rehearsing online. I just, no, it's in person. I don't want to do it. I can't do it. Not interested. And these young dancers, like Tony said, they learned three pieces online. I was like, what? And they were showing up for rehearsal and I was blown away. I said, okay, if, if y'all could do it, I could do it. I'll learn how to teach on Zoom. Um, so it was a, um, an incredible piece of grace that was given to me, right? Uh, then uh, George Floyd was killed. And so we had to, as a company say, let's we need to pause. Um, and then the money kind of ran out and I said, let's come together on a volunteer basis if you want. So then, not the whole week, just twice a week. If you want to come, you can come. So dancers were coming, apprentices were coming, alumni were coming. So, oh my goodness. All of us like, no, we need, um, we need each other, right? And then um, we got the opportunity to uh, get some support to go into a bubble because the foundation heard that we were working on Zoom. Um, and so that was another kind of blessing that came our way. And so I think uh, I made grace 20 years ago for the Alvin Ailey American Dance Theater. And I thought I knew what grace was, right? I was raised Pentecostal. And so my mother and all of those people up in heaven now kind of remind me what it is. Um, and years ago, um, we had an apprentice that I, I had met at, uh, in Richmond, Virginia, at Virginia Commonwealth University. So this is maybe 10 years ago. We're rehearsing at the Joyce Theater. And I get a, a phone call that uh, Malik, his name is Malik Jones, was in this terrible car accident. And so I go, oh my goodness, I get on the train, I go down to DC and he's in a coma, young guy. And I just, my heart is like broken open. Like I couldn't believe it. So it's young guy, young guy, young guy, young guy. So then maybe three weeks later, I call his mom to check on her and Malik answers the phone. <laughs> Oh, I say, Brother Malik, uh, what are you doing? He said, oh, I'm teaching capoeira. I said, no, 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 <laughs> you were in a coma three weeks ago. What is going on? He said, I think you guys prayed me to life. I said, Malik, I just, uh, I'm going back to New York, right? After this, we are performing grace tonight. And I think all these years I've known, I have my idea of what grace is. Uh, but tell me what, what grace is. He said, oh, it's getting a, another chance when you really don't deserve it. So I think I um, 
continue to learn what grace is <laughs> because it's more than I thought. Yeah, and I'm grateful for it. Grateful for every, grateful for every lesson. Yeah. Thank you for that and, and for that story. Um, John, I'm gonna turn to you. How, how has Grace showed up, whether at the center or in the clinic or, or all those places? You know, I think to answer this question, I'm really drawing from my clinical experience. And I think that what's really been interesting is there's been sort of a shift over the course of this last year. When, when the pandemic first hit, people were so concerned about our well-being. It was really beautiful. I've never seen anything quite like that where our patients that we serve, that we care for, were worried about us. And, and I should just be very clear, I'm a primary care person. I'm in a clinic. I'm not in a COVID unit. I'm not an intensive care doctor. I'm not in the ERs. I'm not working as a paramedic, You know, going into apartments in New York to get people. So my risk is really low, but the 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 kindnesses, and I think of grace in many ways as being kind of those little kindnesses, that courteous goodwill. And um, people reaching out to us, reaching out to me saying, you know, I found some N95 masks my dad was using for some carpentry work. Can we drop them off for you? And it was just really beautiful. And, and my clinic's across the street from the Guthrie Theater in Minneapolis. And, you know, people reaching out and saying, hey, our costume People are unemployed right now and they're making masks. Can they, can they provide you and your staff with some masks? And it's like, of course, and can, what can we pay? And it's like, no, 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 it's on us. And it's like, oh my gosh, that is just so kind. And then there's been a bit of a transition. And I think that in, in you know, my goodness, we've been through a very ungraceful four year period, I think, and, 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 and it's done something to us. And I think that we kind of got through that, but as the months have gone by of this pandemic, now what's happening is I think that we as, as clinicians and as caregivers are really having to think of grace in terms of our patients, because frankly, people are getting really, really tired of this and they're, they're frustrated. And I've never seen so many people, you know, 74 year olds that wish they were 75 and 64 year olds wish that they were 65 because they just want the vaccine. And though we know it's not a panacea, it's not perfect. It's still like this thing. And because, there's this supply and demand mismatch and we had poor management, let's say before you know, mid-January, um, we're, we're paying for that now and we're having to make up and it's just really been frustrating. And so I've, I've seen this shift go from grace extended heavily toward caregivers to us having to be, you know, extend grace as we always do, but it may be in a different way and even more so now um, to our patients and, and trying to, to extend that to them. Lana, I'm gonna let that segue into, into my next question for all of you. And, and John, maybe we'll stick with you a little bit just about, about where grace is missing in our current moment. And it might be you know, in your clinical practice or it might be in Minneapolis or it might be in the world, but where, where is it missing? And then also what should we do about it? So I think um, as a, white man, as a man of privilege, I have never had to be as introspective as I have been since George Floyd's um, killing. Um, I live south of Lake Street in Minneapolis. Um, you know, the target that was um, set on fire is my target. My YWCA is there. We go to that Cub Food. I mean, that's that was our neighborhood. And I have um, felt very, very connected and very um, conflicted during this time. And I think that um, I've never become so aware of the privilege that um, many of my patients have, honestly. And it's just never occurred to me. I've been blind to it to a large extent. And so this has been um, a really important milestone in my personal life this last year for all kinds of reasons. Um, and I think what has happened is that privilege sometimes makes people very ungraceful, ungrateful, um, you know, um, ugly, frankly. And this has been uh, probably one of my great challenges right now. And, and I think this is partly, you know, it's people who are um, asking for vaccine the loudest are often the people of the most privilege, you know, that, that you know, I was, I was planning to go to Arizona for the winter and now look at this mess, I can't go. And it's like, do you realize like, where that's coming from and what that sounds like through today's lens, through today's optics. And like, often they don't. 
and I, it's, it, it's very hard for me. I, I can't be scolding to my patients. That's not my job. Um, but it is requiring of us a lot of, um, fortitude, a, a lot of grace to, to, you know, treat everyone with respect and dignity and because people aren't, um, very dignified sometimes. And it's, it's just been very difficult. So I think that, you know, does that tie into my center's work? And, you know, one of the, one of our four main pillars of the Center for the Art of Medicine is to encourage empathy among our learners and to, and, you know, we all know that it's not just sympathy. It's not just, you know, expressions of, you know, I hope, oh, I'm sorry about that, but it's more like, you know, feeling what someone is feeling and putting your shoe, your feet in someone else's shoes and really experiencing that. And I, I know that today's learners, and by that I really mean like our, our people in healthcare that are learning, are entering with, with eyes wider open than they've been before. And so I think one of our jobs is to really um, work with, you know, our diverse learners, our, our, our people representing more and more voices and backgrounds um, to maintain their empathy. And more than that too, it's a call to action. I mean, I do think that there is a movement for us to be um, more proactive than we've been and not be so reactive to things. Um, I know that's true for me and, and others. And how that exactly ties into grace, you know, I, I, I don't know, but it, it's, um, it's just been a, it's been a trying time and I have, um, I think many of us are just just so much more um, reflective and, and thankful and um, exhausted than we've been um, in just about any other time. Gerard, I'm gonna come back to you next just because of the, the work that you've talked about doing in your community and sort of getting out of the restaurant and, and, and being in those areas. What are you seeing? You know, where where is Grace missing, and and is there is there something we need to do? Um, I think from my vantage point, I've, I've definitely seen uh, a lack of grace of people who were at or below the poverty lines before the pandemic started, before uh, George Floyd was killed. This has only um, magnified the situations that they're dealing with on a day to day basis. Um, you know, I look, I look at an area like North Minneapolis, which is very close to me and dear to my heart. Um, and, you know, people don't understand like what it's like to lose a grocery store or, you know, how that has an impact on a whole, uh, a part of city, a part of the city. Um, and so I think I've, I've seen grace come together with just the communities, um, coming together to meet its own needs, which has probably been one of the most beautiful things that I've seen out of this time. Um, but I think, you know, just looking at where resources have gone and, and, and where um, focus has been, I think there's a lot of people who have been left out of some of the resources. I, I've been looking even as an employer to see where benefits are going on a daily basis and, and those type of things. Um, that people are still suffering and, and, and aren't necessarily out. There's a lot of people who haven't been able to go back to work. Um, and even in my industry, um, figuring out what that looks like, you know, restaurants were asked to pause and to hold and, and a lot of them, uh, have closed and haven't been given, uh, the opportunity to kind of rebuild, you know, a lot of them are, are going to continue to be closed. And so I think in those two areas, um, from where, from where I sit, it's been, uh, a difficult run. I've seen some very, very, uh, talented restaurateurs and chefs that, um, are out and then I've also uh, kind of been in my community and just seen there's times where there needs to be resources and um, they just they don't make it there I, it's it's been very much a blessing like I said to see the community come together and pull its own resources and um, some of the, the young people in my area just have been resilient in figuring out how to make it happen uh, and I think that in part is is that some of the reason why we've survived because that mentality of not giving up is is uh, continue to press on, but uh, it's difficult. You know, I'm I'm uh, my my business is in North Loop, uh, and so there's some pockets that just you know can be unaffected, uh, while you know you can be very close to an area that is uh, that's hurting and definitely in need. So we try to really kind of bridge that gap by being intentional about letting. Uh, our, our, our customer base be able to sponsor meals or you know whatever where if we're helping raise money for um, 
some of the food banks that are kind of popped up, not, not the actual food banks, but some of the ones that have popped up in different communities uh, are going to just be able to go out and feed and, and be able to provide those resources. But yeah, I think um, for me, that's what where I would say it's it's been missing. And um, but I've also just seen uh, a new breed of, of leadership that's young and um, has good ideas and smart. And, and so that gives me hope. Uh, that, that we're headed in the right direction. Thank you. And and since we are talking about what, what we can do about it, I see that there's um, there's a link for Soul Bowl in the chat. So if folks feel inspired to, to donate some meals and, and step up in that way, um, the, the link is right there for you. Um, yeah, it's, it's been good. We've done, uh, we, we did 2000 meals this summer, um, right, right in North Minneapolis where we were able to, to give out and we did baskets for Thanksgiving. And, um, you know, we work with some places that house transient youth here. Um, and so those uh, meals that donated, we we're very intentional about, uh, intentional about making sure they're going to spaces and areas, um, you know, that aren't, aren't necessarily getting their resources first. So um, if that's on your heart, uh, please, we, we would, Appreciate all the support we can get, um, and there's a lot of needs that you know don't make the don't make the front news that people are still in need, and we want to continue to support them until everybody's kind of back on their feet. Thank you for that, Tony. What's your perspective as somebody who you know was was born in the Twin Cities and is working here now? Oh, well, where is care missing or grace missing? Um, and I would say in caring for others, um, you know, we focus in, we have the tendency to focus in on, you know, what we individually are missing or needing and, um, you know, the care to, for, an, for others to wear a mask, right. Or the care to slow down and, and help people through, um, it's, it's the ushering. Yeah. So that's how I see it. That's how I imagine this or feel this sense of um, grace missing is in caring um, and allowing ourselves to care for more than ourselves, which is a practice. Um, hmm. What do we need to do? We need to watch grace. We need to watch Mr. Ronald K. Brown's grace over and over and any time and anywhere it is. And I say that because I didn't know um, Mr. Brown's work until he premiered the work Grace on the Ailey Company. And it, the dancing is profound, but how through grace, the work, I mean, imagine a, a, an, a work called grace, that's a high, you know, how's that going to happen, right? And it does. The work touches us, it brings us in um, individually into expansions of ourselves. And the work and every every other thing I have ever experienced about or through Mr. Brown's work has touched me in a way that has inspired me to be human and better and feeling and listening and confident. And I believe that the art and the gift in which we're able to, um, the blessing that we're able to create through dance um is extremely powerful for human beings not just performative but it has an it invokes in us the spirit of care the spirit the spirit of self um and others and how we share um and how we are connected um so the more ways that we can find ourselves to be connected and less separated um and eat each other's food i feel is that's what we need to do Thank you. I, I will mention since I was talking about the chat before that our um, front of house folks have put a link 
to um, to the event where you can watch Grace on Wednesday night. There's a beautiful performance that was done at the Fisher Center. I think it was at Bard College. Um, and so you'll have a chance to, to see a, a gorgeous recording with live music of, of that piece um, on Wednesday evening. The original plan had been for, for the performance program that you would see to include all of Grace and all of Mercy, you know, both, um, both works of art and concepts that we really need right now. I'm happy that we'll still have this beautiful solo from Grace on the live program and that we have the chance to also watch the, the full piece on, on Wednesday night before that premieres. So Mr. Brown, your thoughts about where we need Grace and, and what we can do about it. Well, I wanna thank uh, Brother Gerard for reminding us about service and Tony Pearsan's sister, yes, yes, yes. Um, so I think for me, it's, it's been a reminder for me to bring grace forward. I have, uh, uh, I guess, three apprentices and they have been working hard in Zoom, in these bubbles and making le leaps and bounds, right? And then when we're in St. Louis in uh, January, one of them said, I just got a call from my um, my job, right? So they had to let me go. And so I'm like, okay, so what, how can I serve this young man who took off <laughs> from his job to be on the road with us? Um, at the same time, again, I'm the oldest of four. I have three nephews, three nieces and four godchildren. So when my baby sister came down, down here with my two nephews, then uncle had to be on Zoom because the young nephews were in school, right? And so, yes, I have my own assignment, but now this is also what I have to take care of in a different way than, brother, can you please talk to your nephews? They need you. No, they're in my apartment right now and I have to double check the homework, give them new assignments. And so my job as a caretaker <laughs> has expanded in a beautiful way that I love, right? So, because when I, um, I like to get an assignment and then my job is just to be obedient. Then I don't have to, <laughs> then you don't have to make a bunch of decisions. So yeah, oh, my job is to be the caretaker, great. Then I'm, a, I'm kind of off the hook. I try and do that in my work and with my family and with my company and with everyone, <laughs> right? You need me, I'm there because it's it, it brings me um, blessings. <laughs> it's a blessing to be a servant. Yeah, so that's how I feel it. Um, just a reminder of where I need to show up with more grace, how I can show up more gracefully, which I'm, I'm grateful for all of it, right? I'm glad you mentioned the caretakers. I think that that's a place where, like it, there's a certain barometer of grace around how, um, how people and how employers and, and everybody are, are treating people who are caretakers right now, whether people are caretakers for young children or caretakers for older generations in their family. We're lucky at the University of Minnesota that our president has been very understanding and very public about the fact that she understands that there's all of this other care going on. I think that there are kind of other places in life where that can be a little bit more difficult, but I, I've, seen, I've seen it create, you know, just sort of a, a whole new level of of stress for people I know who are parents or who are taking care of their parents. And it's just, it, it requires more grace to, to you know, be able to acknowledge and, and also assist those caretakers. So thank you. Thank you for that work and also for, for bringing that up tonight. Um, this question is mostly for Mr. Brown and Ms. Pierce Sands, but I'm happy to hear from, from our other panelists as well. But I want to dive in a little bit more into the importance of the artistic forms of grace and, and to think about that in the way that, that they might help with healing these dual pandemics. We've talked tonight very briefly about George Floyd, and we've also talked a lot about COVID and you know this idea that, that it's it's not just a pandemic, there are multiple pandemics that involve systemic racism as well as disease. Um, and I'm interested in you know, just kind of hearing your, your perspective and, and Mr. Brown, we can stay with you just around like, what's the importance of, of the arts in, in healing in, in both of these instances? You know, it was uh, I don't know, maybe, uh, maybe 10 years ago, the, um, I was asked to be the keynote speaker 
for uh, arts and health. <laughs> this, this meeting of health practitioners, doctors, nurses, and, um, and so I said, so the first thing I'm going to do is dance for you guys, right? And I did, did this piece for you, which I uh, created for, um, in honor of uh, the uh, late director of the American Dance Festival, Stephanie Reinhardt. And then we just talked about how, and I, I believe that all artists feel this way, but for me, dance is a conversation that's kind of heart to heart, spirit to spirit. And so is where we can show you um, the reflection of the human condition, the tenacity, the perseverance, right? The grief and the joy, like all of those things are part of who we are. And I think dance can show that um, and share that and people get to witness it and say, oh, oh, I recognize that in myself or in my neighbor. Um, and, um, and at the end of the whole thing, if you feel forgiveness at the end of grace there's this embrace where the whole thing is going on this whole journey and in the last section there's this embrace where people forgive each other for behaving as if they did not understand God's grace right and so then they walk through the threshold back up to heaven because they get another chance so I think when people see the work and they go oh my goodness I love the music oh Duke Ellington those sacred concerts come Sunday. Oh, the house music, Gabrielle, the angel of love coming down. Um, I leave and I feel so good. Is that okay? I say, yes. <laughs> Go out into the world with that joy and spread that, spread that. And I think dance can do that for people. Lift them up and let them know what is possible and um, that we can get through um, anything and everything. And I tell people all the time that our folks have gone through worse and so for me, it's like, oh, it's still going on, right? So when we thought, okay, I know the militia were hiding out somewhere, somewhere. Oh, all of a sudden they got permission to come out. Oh, right, you're not hiding anymore. Okay, okay, okay. But you're always there, right? And I saw this crazy um, uh, meme the other day. They said, oh, some folks are upset that some folks won't get over slavery but some folks are not over the fact that they lost their slaves, right? So if we could fix all of that through dance <laughs> with the conversation of what is grace and what is truth. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. Take that joy out into the world and, and spread it around. Mm -hmm. Ms. Pierce Sands, your thoughts about, about the role of the arts in, in healing? You know, I um, I don't separate myself from um, the artist and the watcher, um, but I have those perspectives. And as the artist moving into the work, there is the service of Um, mirroring or feeling or tapping into who we are as human beings, who the, who the watchers are, who's sitting in the audience. And the, my service as the artist is to permeate that out without a conclusion, but the experience. So therefore our audience, the, the audience, the participants of the watching, um, can see and feel themselves. Even if, you know, we're hyper physical and do these amazing things, and that is also part of being human. We all as human beings can experience ourselves through others of the physicality. So the so the art and the art, the artists um, are extremely important for the artists themselves, but also to be the transparency of who we are and who we can be. Um, you know, I, I never took lightly, especially in Minnesota, um, when I was performing the fact that I was a African-American woman's body and what just that emulated, 
right? What that experience for others to watch my process, to feel. Um, so the art of dance specifically from is, is about service of ourselves and to ourselves through um, the choreographic um, vision. And, and then, you know, I, I was listening to Mr. Brown and just feeling this sense of, of loss during this time and not having the art and living the art the way that we've known to live it, you know, going to the studio every day and do our thing and then perform and audience and all, all of the spectacle. Um, and there's an absence of that. And to be quite frank, um, I think the absence of it has been important to understand the importance of it for the, for the practitioners who are doing it and for the audience um, and the watchers that are also participating in it. Um, and you know, I, I, I was lucky to teach um, several classes for um, Evidence Dance Company. Ron had asked me to teach. And <clears throat> it was a sense of joy to be able to work with those artists and those dancers, but also to know that in order for these dancers and Ron to, to, to create this bubble was not taken for granted and brought back the, the seed of, of this art form that is so important and that I gravely miss and am excited for what it will be because it will shift and it will change and it should shift and it should change. And it will be influenced by where we are now, systematic racism, you know, none of this stuff is new, but maybe we've had this opportunity to, to really look and feel about it. And we just emulate it. The artists, we just do it. We emulate it. It's poetry. It's, it lives. It lives in our bodies. It does. And, and I think, you know, just sort of responding to a couple of different themes that you were talking about, I think that there, there will be this feeling when we can get back into the theater together. And I think that it, it's going to feel like a, a wave washing over us. But at the same time, we can't just think about how do we get back? You know, the, it, it, everything has to be different than it was before. Otherwise, we're not learning what we need to learn from what we're going through right now. Yeah, Dr. Halberg. Can guys add? So a few years ago, both the Minnesota Orchestra and the St. Paul Chamber Orchestra were on strike. They were locked out. And I remember thinking at the time, like within a part of the population, the Twin Cities, that was a huge loss. It, was a, it, had, a, it had a certain feeling of, of, of loss. And I remember thinking like, it's almost like a public health crisis because I don't think that people realize like how much healing occurs from being in the presence of great art. And, and, you know, people go to concerts, they go to dance, they go to theater for catharsis and, and to let this, this magic sort of wash over them. And, um, and, and that got resolved. And think of where we are now. Like, I mean, I think of like the, the, you know, sports have kind of figured out a way to make this work. We're seeing basketball, we're seeing football, we're seeing baseball on some level, it's modified. But the arts, I mean, it's just, I mean, I don't mean to say decimated, but it's kind of been decimated. I mean, I'm across the street from a hall that's sitting, you know, dark and Northrop is sitting dark and all these theaters in New York and across the country are just, it's like, they're just sighing to be of use again. And, and I really think this is like a public health crisis that there's not live art. I mean, we're, we're, we're pivoting, we're adapting, we're making things happen. Thank God. You know, I mean, if we didn't have shows that we could stream on television, you know, I mean, what, where would we be or books to read or poetry to read and, and events like this and, and video, but still we're not there. 
And there is something that happens there that is really deep and really powerful. And I remember once I had a conversation with a flutist. Um, I was on tour as the tour physician with someone from the St. Paul Chamber Orchestra. And she was like kind of entertaining a career change, like trying to do something more important in healthcare than what she was doing. And I said, hold on a second. You do know that every time you're on stage that there's like a thousand people that you are providing healing to. And she never really thought of it that way, which I thought was really interesting as an artist, as a professional artist who makes her living doing that, that she hadn't thought about that as healing. And I think it's absolutely healing. And as someone who's an observer watching you, watching you artists. Um, so I'm hoping this public health crisis of the lack of live arts comes to a, a rapid end and we're still gonna need patience and grace uh, to get to that point. But I uh, can't, you know, I think we're just gonna be as you've said, we're going to be bursting, um, you know, just to, to, to get back to where we had been before with, with live uh, performance, with live art. Yeah, patience and grace and, and masks still on in a very practical kind of way. Gerard, was there anything that you wanted to say about that or I can give the next question to you? I just was going to say uh, in, in my little bubble, I, I have a lot of uh, young adults that work with me. And music has been uh, just instrumental in kind of allowing us to grieve together. Um, I, I speak a little bit specifically just for um, hip hop, but there's been one of the things I've seen is why other you know arts are suffering. Like music has just been abundance. It's been coming out so fast. Um, while because I think artists are you know musical artists are sitting at home and they're they're able to put music out. Um, but it's been really helpful for me and my team. And I think it's provided some answers when we didn't have words that songs were able to kind of bring us together um, and also uh, empower us in some sense, you know, and when we could be feeling down or oppressed um, and just be able to provide joy. So that's been helpful. Uh, if you ever come to Sobo, there's music playing nonstop. Uh, and so we're, it, it's been a blessing for me. We have um, some of our employees are older than me. And so being able to hear some of the songs that are from the eighties and the seventies that just provided um, just some kind of classic joy for us. And that's been uh, really instrumental in just like bringing some positive energy. And we in, we in turn internalize that energy and put it into the food and give it out to the guests. So it's been uh, helpful uh, for me kind of going through the last year. I think I found myself kind of listening and um, listening with my team to just a lot more positive uh, music, so. Thank you. My next question is a little bit more targeted toward toward you and, and John, and, and I was trying to think about frontline workers. And, and I will say out loud that like everybody in this Zoom room, everybody on the call is essential. I think that we're all essential workers, but I, when we think about the front lines, a lot of times we're thinking about healthcare and we're thinking about food, whether that's people working in grocery stores or working in, in restaurants and, you know, like sort of taking care of, of those basic human needs. And, um, and I'm wondering about how we can encourage grace, how, how we can create grace for the people who are working for you, John, for your colleagues who are, you know, maybe more on the emergency side of things. Like how, how can we encourage and create grace specifically for those people, whether that's on a personal level or on a policy level, or are there things we need to advocate for or, or practices that, that we need to work on? Um, I, I would say, uh, you know, the policy level, obviously there's, there's just allocation of funds. It's interesting because I'm going through this process actively um, and it's a lot of red tape. It's, it, it's difficult. I uh, opened a restaurant. Uh, I opened a restaurant, Bad Wings, during this time. Um, and, you know, just so for instance, is that, um, you know, when there was money being given out, any restaurants that actually opened last year weren't eligible. So if you didn't, if you didn't have a, a business tax return from the previous year, you were in a sense ineligible to receive funds, whether you had a restaurant that was thriving or struggling or or doing all of the things that were asked of you. Um, and that's just one of the, 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 the for instance, um, I think just supporting what you love, I think is, is, is what I would say. Um, if, you, if you like something, if you enjoy it, whether that's art, whether it's food, um, just being intentional about supporting local and, and, and entrepreneurs, um, because it, it, it makes a big difference. I've seen some places where um, this might be your favorite place to go. And, you know, maybe under normal circumstances, you go every other month or 
or, or, or once a month being able to frequent those places just a second visit um, is impactful, you know, and I've seen uh, in my industry, people be resilient, whether it's gift cards or paying for meals for others and um, being creative about finding other ways to um, support them. Um, but I just think, you know, really kind of being tenacious about supporting what you love, especially, um, you know, when it comes to uh, restaurants or arts, that's what's impactful, letting them know, um, because it, it is difficult. I think there's, there's for all of us have been uh, for me, especially it's just been dark days of like, how long can we continue to do this? And is the support going to make it in time? You know, you're looking at the timeline of, of, of uh, running a business and operations and is it going to make it in time? Um, and so I think just that, that's where I've seen it. The people I, I've really gotten a chance to see like our, our core uh, clientele because they make it known like we want you guys to be here when this is over and we really appreciate that and um, those kind words and, and, and them supporting us just been the, the world to us. It, it just brings like a smile and joy to the team to see those people to say, we're so glad that you're still here. This is important to us. Um, this is something that we want to, to survive what's going on. So yeah, just, I think just being intentional. I do it myself. There's restaurants that I love and um, there's definitely opportunities where I could stay home and cook and, you know, I, I make it a point to go out of my way to support some of my other colleagues in the city to let them know, hey, even on my night off, I can go to a local place and show love and you order takeout or, you know, buy food for somebody else because it is very impactful to kind of keeping everything going. Thank you for those ideas. You know, I, I think that a lot of us have been trying to, you know, sort of do the the take out and support local businesses thing. But but tonight, the idea of buying food for other people seems like something that should be obvious, but I, but I personally hadn't thought of it. So I appreciate you bringing that to, to our attention. John, what about- I'm glad you went first because it gave me a chance to rethink my initial response, which was, you know, I think being in healthcare, it's so easy to be kind of myopic and think, oh, I wish just wish people would be kinder to my staff or they'd be more understanding, but that's not really the right answer. I think that, you know, we in healthcare are really lucky. We have jobs, we have, we have you know, well-paying jobs. Yes, we've taken salary cuts and there's been a few furloughs and things like that, but we are really lucky that way. We are lucky because we get to serve, we get to care for people. It's just a profound experience to be able to do that. And so I think my more, my, you know, a bigger, more important answer for this is we need to do something at, at the policy level. We need to do big things, big thoughts. We need to be working on social determinants of health. I think that, you know, um, there's such inequity in this country, in this city, um, in this state. Um, you know, if we look at, you know, we talk about people at higher risk of COVID. It's not because they're black or because they're colored skinned. It's because of of the social aspect of everything, right? So it's it's not a genetic thing, it's a social thing. And it's a social thing because of lack of access to care and, and all the things that go into that. And so that's what we really need. And, and this is something I've become very, um, not just aware of, I've, I've been aware of it before, but I think until this year, and frankly, you know, shame on us that took a pandemic to sort of figure this out, to make it, to really lay bare a lot of the problems that we have as a society and that we have in healthcare. And, and yet, you know, the, what an opportunity for us to, to really see that, you know, to know that um, this is the stuff that we, the hard work that we have to readdress that has been sitting on a massive pause button for the last four years. And uh, we just really need to address that. And, um, you know, I think people should take heart in the fact that many, many good people know this. And that I think that the time has come for us to really start addressing this and making some big changes. And um, you know, we should be we should come out of this better than when we entered this whole this whole time. I'm going to get one more question in, just and and I'll take volunteers for who wants to to go first and answer it. And then after after this question, we'll go to the Q and A. I can see that we've got a couple of questions, and folks should feel free to to put their questions in the in the Q and A box as well. Um, but when, um, when we first started talking about this residency, I had been working with Pam Green from PMG Arts Management, who has been the longtime agent for Evidence. And, and I think that she, you know, along with, um, with Mr. Brown and Evidence was kind of the mastermind of this, this grace anniversary residency idea, this idea of like all of these activities that we can talk about. 
And, and when she said, let's say grace and talk about it, like it just took me back to all of those like family meals as a kid and, you know, saying grace being this idea of like the blessings that we invoke before we eat together. It's one of the reasons that I'm so glad that Chef Class is with us tonight, because I mean, I, I think that that idea of saying grace, like it's about breaking bread and, and it's about invoking these blessings. So I'm interested in any anecdotes or philosophies or just kind of, you know, practices that you have around offering grace before you start a process, before you start a day. And then also just questioning that idea is saying grace about giving or receiving, or is it, is it both of those things? Mr. Brown, you're leaning forward, but, but um, he, he Chef Class is unmuted. So <laughs> we'll let Mr. Brown go first and then, and then I'll get to Chef Class next. One, I, I, I love to cook. I love to eat and saying grace is the way to say thank you. Thank you for this nourishment that we're about to receive. May it give us strength and nourishment for everything that we need, right? It's a nourishment to go out and do the work, but thank you for us being together. And so the, um, it's interesting that when, the, when, I, when I eat with my nephews and my baby sister, y'all yeah, let the nephews say grace, but the, the older one, we also have to always have to remind him and thank you for the food. He'll go off. <laughs> thank you for all the other things, but then the mother has to say, and thank you for this food, right? Because that's the thing that's going to give us <laughs> what we need to go out into the world. So when when Pam and I were talking about this, you know, she's a we worked together for over 20 years, smart, smart, smart. And it just made sense that we come together to eat. Or, you know, we can't eat because we are on Zoom. But to have a moment where we would have a chance to sit and talk and just what is grace to you while we share this meal that's going to make us feel wonderful. Right. Yeah, I just was going to add in, um, I, I'm kind of in a similar thing. I have a three year old. And so uh, that, that was funny to me because my son is the same way that we'll ask him to say grace and he'll name every cousin that he has and forget that the prayer was about the food, you know? And so, <laughs> um, but for me, it, it's always been just a foundation of taking a, a moment to pause. Um, there's just so gratitude and also to um, just kind of create, I, I think it almost sets that, uh, brings everybody on an even playing field. Like it just sets that balance. When you get an opportunity, you're gonna eat and you say grace, um, I've seen um, just so many good conversations come and it always just kind of sets the tone for me, you know, that um, it's it's a blessing to be here. Things are very difficult and have been difficult, um, but it, it's still by God's grace that I'm here and able to share this meal with you. And so um, it's, it's, it's difficult with, with the restaurant, but we still try to pass that along, um, that every day is a blessing in these meals that we get to share are uh, both opportunities to have very necessary conversations where we can slow down and and something tasty can kind of cut the tension and we can really get into um, uh, you know a conversation and for my my uh, my grandmother she would say uh, it was just an opportunity to get the kids able to sit still long enough for her to be able to put something in their heads while they were putting something in their bellies uh, and so I try to take that same concept with with my team like let's sit down let's let's say grace let's have a meal together um and let's talk about things that are going to benefit our minds while we're while we're having something that's substance that's filling our bodies so go ahead john uh, so two quick things so I, i've got a 24 soon to be 25 year old son who's in grad school at the u i've got a 20 year old daughter who should be in college she took the year off is doing americorps they're living with us of course and so when we actually get together for dinner, we, you know, they take turns, we point to one of them to say grace, or, or, you know, with dinner, and it's like about as fast as they can say it. But even doing that in kind of slightly humorous way, it allows us to just, you know, be thankful for the fact that we're all healthy, that we're together, that we have this opportunity that we didn't think was coming our way. It's sort of a gift of the pandemic. And I have found that when I go to bed at night, I, I'm not one to say a prayer or say a grace before I go to bed. But I do find myself closing the day, you know, as the weight of the down comforter sort of settles down and perhaps the dog jumps on the bed and curls over on my feet. 
how grateful I am to, to be able to breathe comfortably. I think with this pandemic, I've never, and, and, and with George Floyd, I think breath has become like this metaphor for the whole year of like, who would have thought that just breathing becomes such an important, we, may, we well know it intuitively, but, but this year has laid bare like how, you know, people going to emergency rooms in New York with an oxygen level of 60% and not knowing how sick they were. So I just find myself every night just thinking, you know, that, that like I am so grateful, like I'm breathing comfortably and I have this warm home and in a way that I, I never have before. So I'm, I'm actually kind of grateful to this time to be grateful for something that I take for granted. Yeah, Tony, you were gonna say something before. When you were, John, were you talking about breath and George Floyd and you know, I think about masks and what that creates on us all now of that sense of the difficulty to breathe. So there's a unification of, you know, starting with George Floyd, not starting with, but the sense of breath and then the appreciation of the consciousness of the gift of breath. Um, when we don't have our masks, it's the attention. Um, so I just wanted, that was pretty profound. Um, but in terms of for grace, we've been blessed to share be, before the pandemic, um, many meals with Ron and our friend, Arcel. And Ron would always be like, okay, grace. And I'm at a table with Ron K. Brown. I'm like, yes, he's gonna say grace. And I'm prepared. And then he goes, he calls somebody else out. Um, and that is one of the most incredible, humbling moments um, to be asked to share in the grace of our food, but also the gesture of holding hands. And that's a circle, right? That's our community and automatically what that I'm a physical person and what that brings to us of just the action of hands holding circle and breath and then designating who's going to say grace um, and the reflection of what that literally does for us in our system and it's it's not obvious until you say grace until you're in the circle My family was a hands holding saying grace family too. And then I remember going and, you know, spending the night with a friend whose family was not a hands holding grace saying family. And that can create some, you know, humorous situations. But yeah, I, I, that, that's part of it, that creating the circle and actually having that moment of touch with each other that we're missing right now. What, one beautiful thing about that. So my, um, my five year old got, now he's seven, right? But uh, ourselves, nephew. So now he demands and some of the families are Buddhists, right? But he demands, no, we have to hold hands because Nino said we have to hold hands to say grace. So when he started doing it like five, they're like, what is he doing? He said, oh, his godfather says you have to hold hands to say grace. <laughs> <laughs> so it's great that the five-year-old is doing the same thing. Yeah, even though the rest of the family's like, we don't do that. No, Nino says we have to do that. Godfather says we have to do that. So you're not the only one to me. <laughs> So I'm going to go to some audience questions. And, and the first one is for Mr. Brown from, from our audience member, Steve. He is wondering if your perception of grace has evolved over the past two decades since the work grace premiered and has the choreography for the work evolved as well in your restagings of it. So I think it is uh, the definition has expanded, right? So I, I tell uh, dancers, um, they have to, we have to learn from the work. And so as a choreographer, I'm also learning from it. I haven't changed uh, a lot in the piece. I think I've added an extra person in the, in the piece that you'll see on Wednesday was 12 on Ailey. Evidence will do it with eight, but I think 13 people are on the stage. Um, um, and so I think I've, I've made it more clear, the material 
Yeah, when uh, when the early company was doing it, uh, Miss Judith Jamison was the, still the artistic director, and we have, we I met her in 1987, right? So they they would do the piece, and we were just having honest conversation about whether they had the dancers who could actually perform it, right? Because you, people wanted to do it, but sometimes people didn't have the um, yeah, didn't have the humility to do it. Because to do, to do grace, you have to start <laughs> going the journey, but you need some humility and your ego has to be in check. Uh, but then she might call me and say, oh, Ron, they're taking it to the club. Please come here and fix it. Right? So with my company, I make sure that, so you can't party more than the audience, right? You have to go on the journey, tell the story and let them witness it. Let the audience have a great time, right? You can't, you know, be in the club in the piece. No, no. Tell the story of the piece. Uh, right, because you have to serve the piece. So I think I've, I've made it more clear. Yeah. The, the next question I'm going to, to ask you, John, and it's um, our audience member, Lorraine. She's, she's asked a very beautiful and complicated question. And I'm going to just kind of summarize it by asking the, the beginning of it. She's wondering about research or diagnostics in the development of racism, prejudice, power, privilege as a health disorder, rather than acceptance as something requiring deference and privilege. And so I'm wondering if you could even just talk a little bit more about the social determinants of health that you mentioned before, um, because that's something that I just learned about a couple of years ago when I was um, at my other university in a, in a public health forum, forum. And I think that that might give some insight into this question. Sure, I will do my best. I mean, I, I feel so humbled by even trying to, you know, express uh, what, what this is. And, but let me, let me um, I'll share it this way. So, you know, um, before George Floyd was killed, in medical education, and I can't speak for nursing education or other professional schools because I'm, I'm not in those schools, but I'm in the medical school at the University of Minnesota. And I can say that, you know, there has been a huge effort um, to think about these things. And so social determinants of health, that even that term is a little controversial because it implies that like a person is determined, you know, like it's preordained that you're going to be a certain way because you grew up in a certain neighborhood, let's say. So some people have said that well, we shouldn't call it determinants, we should call it um, risk, social risk, you know, that if you live in a certain place and you have a certain income or a certain education level, that there are going to be challenges, you know, I mean, it's as simple as like, how do you get to the clinic? Do you have money for the bus? If you've got three kids and you have an appointment at nine, how challenging is it, is it for you to get to the clinic in time? And then you show up 10 minutes later, 15 minutes later, and the clinic says, sorry, you're late for your appointment. We're not going to see you. I mean, um, food deserts, you know, living in a place, and, and certainly this was made manifest after the, the rioting that we had that, you know, grocery stores were burned. Okay, that was the one grocery store in certain neighborhoods. Now where are folks going to get, you know, fresh food? Uh, and I mean, the list goes on and on and on. But I think what's really heartening is that, for example, we have in my department, Family Medicine and Community Health, we received an anonymous gift and we created um, a chair. And a chair is like the highest academic award you can give. And the chair we created is the Josie Robinson Johnson Chair in Justice, Equity, Diversity and Inclusion. And we were able to do that after George Floyd's death. It is the only kind of chair like that in the Department of Family Medicine in the country. And I am so proud of that fact that we took that generous gift and we're turning into something like that. We also have a colleague, Dr. Brooke Cunningham. She's a, a, a black internist in our department who lectures the medical students about you know, the, the social construct of race. And this is such a crazy thing for like someone like me to wrap my head around. I mean, about five, six years ago when it was introduced, it's like, I, I just didn't quite understand it, you know, but then, as I hear her lectures every year, as we're talking to our medical students, we're starting to realize that there's no gene for you know, being black per se. There's a gene, we all have genes for our eyebrows, for eyes, for nose, for lips, for skin. 
and it's a collectiveness that, that you know, kind of ultimately creates who we are, but there's no one gene. And, and that is such a, a radical concept for a lot of people, a lot of young people coming to medical school. And we're trying to get rid of, and get away from decades of, you know, we, we measure kidney function. And still when we do like lab results, it says if you're black, your kidney function can be this. And if you're not black, it can be this. And it's like, where did that come from? This has been there forever. And so there's a whole movement to sort of undo that and get rid of that. So I think folks should just know that, that this is the kind of stuff. And some people may argue that, why are you teaching that in medical school? But it's like, we, of course we need to teach this in medical school. Um, but this kind of thing is really coming to the fore. And the last thing I'll just say is that following George Floyd's um, killing, um, the medical school and, and our partner Fairview, uh, M Health Fairview created the Hope Commission. And the Hope Commission has, I think it's four physicians of color who are leading the charge to really think about the systemic racism that's been present in medicine, but specifically in our programs um, over the years, you know, uh, that we are, many of us are blind to and, and completely naive to. Um, so these are things, and, and if I may say, the arts have a way of addressing this. And I know this isn't the best example, but, but you know, 15, no, 20 years ago, when I first came to the medical school, we would do a reading of the play Miss Evers Boys for the medical students. And instead of giving a lecture on racism and research, we would do a reading. It was with the Penumbra, uh, it, was, it was Guthrie actually that put it on, but it was many of the actors, we you know, were regulars at the Penumbra, at the Guthrie, uh, people like T. Michael Rambo. Sean Judge um, was our uh, nurse Evers and she directed the show. And it was the number one rated lecture for about eight years in the med school curriculum. And it was a piece of art. It was a play that addressed this really powerful issue. And I'm very proud of that fact that we used art as a way of promoting conversation among future physicians and getting them to think differently and, and, and really question some things that they um, had you know, taken for granted for, for many, many years. So sorry for the long answer. And I, I feel a little inadequate trying to explain that, but um, thank you for bearing with me and giving that that opportunity. Well, thank you. I appreciate the answer. And, and we are, we're coming up on the end of our time. So I wanted to offer a chance for all of our panelists to share any final thoughts that they wanted to, to share with our audience before, before I kind of close it up for us. I just want to say uh, when, when presenters like Kristen and Dance Cleveland and the Joyce Theater could have said, oh, we can't do anything, <laughs> right? You're able to get these classes, right? Offer it to your, to your community and beyond Minnesota. And you have them seeing Grace live and then seeing a performance where the dancers will be live, which is amazing that presenters during this time was like, I, we can't do anything, have figured out that they can do something as Tony Pierce Sands is doing Brother Gerard, so that all of us on the screen are saying no. I had a great conversation with Michelle and Dagas Cello, who did the music for um, Mercy, probably in July. She said, Ron, this pandemic, people think that we are going to stop, but I'm an artist. I can't stop dreaming and imagining. And we said, yeah, let's not, we can't stop. So then I think artists saying that we are not going to stop, we cannot stop, is part of the, um, the hope. So thank you for everything that you're doing and for all of you being here. This is amazing. Yeah, I would definitely <laughs> agree with Mr. Ron. And as far as Northrop, I was um, a little mouse in Nutcracker centuries ago. And what, how, how Northrop has continued to grow and open and started to look at the world in different ways. Um, it's time has been time. And as that little that little dancer and now here's Ron K. Brown on these stages. Um, so thank you for that. Thank you for continuing to open the, the space for artists um, at North Up in the, in the Twin Cities. It's important. I was just going to say thank you for, for having me on for the opportunity. Um, I think that I would just leave, leave you guys with this, that 
don't worry about fixing the huge issues of everything that's going on. Just find an opportunity to show someone grace in your circle. I think that's I think that's where it starts. And it doesn't have to be these answers of, you know, how do we undo centuries of hurt and wrong? It's just literally getting up and making it a daily mission. Uh, and that's why I try to push uh, myself and, and, and with my team. And it's a difficult thing, uh, but just you know, being being uh, determined and intentional about that has a way of making a, a chain reaction, a domino effect uh, that can just be a wave uh, in, in, in our city and in, in arts and restaurants and the medical field. Uh, and it just takes one person being OK with being uncomfortable and uh, doing something that's impactful. So um, I really push just to try to find somebody in your in, in your circle that needs grace and to be able to show it to them. Uh, and, and in turn, you know, it can it can cause just a wave that we desperately need. So thank you. And uh, I appreciate you guys having me on. Well, I will thank all of you for your kind words. And I am going to give John a moment since he unmuted. No, no, I, I was simply going to say, like, I can't follow up on that. I mean, it's I totally agree with you. And it's it's thank you so much. Well, thank you all for the nice things that you said. That wasn't why I asked you to have some closing words, but but it, it's nice to hear. And I will say that at Northrop, we've been we've been thinking and talking and and working a lot to try to figure out what are the ways that we can continue to provide work for artists. What are the ways that we can continue to inspire our audiences and communities, and what are the ways that we can keep making those connections? Because it, it's what we miss so much about you know having a chance to to be in the theater and be together. And so, you know, we're, we're lucky to have these different, you know, formats and, and media for trying to figure out a, a way to, to make it work and to, to kind of build that bridge back to live performance and then to also kind of like build that bridge into, into the kind of new thinking about the way that we work that, that is needed. So, um, so I really appreciate all four of you being here with us this evening. Uh, I really appreciate all of the audiences in the in the Zoom room who are here with us and, and who showed up for, for this conversation tonight. Um, I, I have to say that I do hope that you will all tune in for the performance that premieres on Thursday night. It's going to be incredible and it will, um, it will literally and also metaphorically give you an opportunity to, to experience grace. Um, and for those of you who um, who are, are or aren't able to join us the rest of this week. I really do hope that we'll see you again soon, whether it's online or in person. So in the meantime, stay warm, stay well. Thank you all very, very much and good night. Have a great evening.